Hey kids, this is Ivan. How you doing? Today I want to talk to you about weevils in the flower. I love that sentence. Ever since Runeslinger made a video um, on time compression and he used that uh, sentence, I just figured I had to make a video with that as a title. That really ought to be a module. Judges Guild, Weevils in the Flower, an adventure for characters level 5 through 7. You know, I ought to write that. It'd be an epic adventure. <laughs> this video is uh, kind of me being in a strange position of playing devil's advocate with myself. And so my position will seem a little schizophrenic at times, which is fair, fair criticism. But um, I think this exposes this internal conflict that uh, I think most of us have um, when we're playing role-playing games, where we have these kind of uh, warring motivations or priorities. Um, and we do this kind of like part science, uh, part art, sort of arcane little uh, dance between using too much hand wavium. You know, it's like, you know, hand waving is that mystical element where it's like, ah, okay, this works. Just time passes, move, move it on. Uh, or, you know, getting super granular and doing this, like, you know, where we're playing alchemists in the Lambics. You know, all of a sudden you go from just uh, playing the uh, the wizard um, that's adventuring to, like, getting super granular and you're just spending, you know, all you're doing lots of die rolls or narration over this really mundane task. Somewhere in the middle, I think, is the sweet spot. You're figuring out just where to be granular and where to narrate over scenes which could have ended badly or much differently or just been plain old tedious and boring. You know, it takes some time. And, you know, so I think we find that there's certain interesting events or moments that we want to role play uh, or roll dice for, and there's other ones that we want to gloss over. You know, sometimes we fast forward not only m over like mundane events, maybe like we ignore three months of travel to move on to a different part of the story, like the cool part. Um, but sometimes we fast forward over significant um, events, and sometimes these things are mechanically significant, uh, like a chance of failure. Uh, but also uh, there's other times that they're significant in terms of like character advancement or improvement. Uh, perhaps we play scenarios that are separated by years, you know, where the characters become more experienced, but we as players never actually experience that journey through gameplay. So we have, have this separation between the characters and the players. So kind of um, want to go over a bunch of bunch of thoughts I had on this because I was thinking about th things like time compression, but also skills like I've been talking about lately, and a lot of other um, parts of role playing games where we have to uh, figure out like how close do we want to zoom in. Or, or, you know, zoom out. So sometimes we choose to zoom in really close to a particular part of the story. That's something of interest. But sometimes we, we choose to zoom out and handle a large group of actions um, by one broad one. So, you know, a good example of this would be something like survival and hunting. Most games have a skill like that somewhere. Where, you know, okay, you've got this one character that has that skill, and what they're going to do is that every day they're going to roll a survival roll to hunt for themselves and the rest of the people that they're with. And if you really think about it, this is like, dozens of actions that could either succeed or fail, but we're just going to make this one global role and kind of move on. Uh, even somebody like Gary Gygax did this way back in, in the day, you know, this, there was a house rule of his that I discovered as I was making a video about like beefing up like old school fighters in D&D, where he had this kind of mook rule where, you know, if you're a, a fighter, like, you know, I, when you got to be fourth level, you could roll a D4, you got to be sixth level, you could roll a D6, eighth level, you roll a D8, you know, etc. But I think to like 12th level, where that was how many mooks the fighter killed in a single round of combat. No attack rolls needed, no hit points, you know, forget all the math. Um, that's how many he killed because he's that badass at that point, which is absolutely ignoring a ch chance of failure and assuming auto success, but it was just kind of moving the game on, you know. Um, there's other, uh, you can do a mathematical analysis on a, in a lot of games on like the combat system and, and a lot of other stuff, but the combat's probably the easiest one to look at, where like in, uh, in something like D&D, you do like the damage per round analysis, where you look at the hit points, the, you know, the weapons they're using, what their, what their attack bonus is, or, you know, place on the Thax Zero matrix, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, armor class, and you, you can tell like, okay, there's a 20% chance of this guy winning and, you know, 80% chance of this guy winning. Uh, you know, something like uh, Advanced Fighting Fantasy, really easy to do that sort of um, uh, mathematical exercise. There's even like mass combat. There's There are mass combat systems. I have one that's called like Original Edition Delta, where it takes, the guys actually run through a computer, figured out exactly what the results would be when all these trolls and all these dwarves and blah, 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 fight each other, and you can make it a couple die rolls. And I think even, you know, like a BCMI had, had a system in their book where it was ridiculous, like, you know, what kind of army it was. Hundreds, thousands of people involved, one die roll, okay, 35% chance your army wins. But it's plausible. You can you can gloss over a whole bunch of stuff. We can pull way, way back if we want to. So t statistically, we can re reduce a lot of things just to one die roll when it comes right down to it. Do you really want to? Depends. Depends on the situation. Do you want to take the average or not take the average? How granular do you want to get? 
you know, it's, it's, it's all the same. Like, you know, even my uh, OSR um, algorithm of generating uh, auto success via something like stats or class or level or all that kind of junk um, that I've talked about, you know, my broadly skilled characters that I like so much. Okay, you have a 15 int uh, intelligence. Okay, you notice all this stuff that the other people don't notice. Or you have a 13 dexterity. Of course, you get across this slippery plank, you know, between these two buildings. I, I For whatever reason, I like that slippery plank example. Not sure how many times I really actually use that, but it works, seems to work for me in these videos. You know, but sometimes we choose to ignore a broad span of time or, you know, a whole bunch of actions because they're freaking boring. <laughs> we want to focus on the good parts while assuming that our characters make it through the rough spots and all that tedium. You know, some of these moments just aren't interesting or suitably dramatic. You know, the weevils and the flowers, probably not all that interesting. And we have, you know, a lot of times we can boil down um, adventuring or whatever you're doing in the game to... Uh, the place of interest, which would be could, be could be a physical place, the dungeon, you know, uh, this or it could be like a scenario, an interaction between two two or other, you know, or many characters, a whole chain of events, whatever it is. So that kind of covers a whole bunch of stuff. The the place of interest, they will call it the temple. Um, but you can look at like what we do in a typical game, whether this is one session or several sessions, really, really kind of classic. Um, especially how a lot of us, you know, our journey in playing, where we first just started out at the place of interest, like Runeslinger mentions in his time compression video. And then we get to the point where you can divide into like, okay, the journey there, the place of interest, and the journey home. And we start to do things like role play the journey there. And, you know, what, what kind of interesting stuff happens as we're getting to whatever the place or situation of interest is. Then, of course, we role play the heck out of the, the situation of interest. Then there's a journey home. And sometimes we decide, well, okay, well, we're going to gloss over that. And sometimes it's because it's boring, and sometimes it's because I don't want to risk somebody taking all this nifty loot. Or, man, we made it this far. It would be a shame to, to lose now, like in real life. Um, and, of course, when, you know, when he made that, uh, gave that example, the first thing I think of is, of course, The Hobbit. You know, Because that book is all about the journey there, and then they're at the Lonely Martin, Mountain, the stuff that happens there. And then he gets home in two pages, well, however many pages it is. And, of course, of course, he has his trusty wizard with him that's going to not leave him this time, but still. You know, stuff happened but it's just it was not uh, convenient for the story at that point so sometimes you know we choose um, to risk ignore or ignore these broad spans of time uh, just because they're boring and sometimes we you know choose to ignore them in order to not risk the consequences of the small chance of failure which I think Anthony even mentions around like 60 minutes in his video because let's face it what if there really were wheels on the flower and the characters starved to death on their way to the meaningful part of the adventure that would suck that could happen you know <laughs> and maybe that's very simulationist. Um, sometimes, though, like a dotted line from Paris to Bangladesh is sufficient. So you, you know, all those movies where the you know the characters going from one place to the other, and you see that that map it pulls out to the map. There's a little dotted line that happens. And sometimes you have to get this great like kind of superimposed photo montage or video montage in the background. I love when a movie does that, where you've got like our intrepid explorer, and he's you know got this montage of him sipping tea with his companions on a train, and then they're in a fist fight in a bazaar and somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, and then they're playing card games on some sort of riverboat, you know, smoking the cigars. And then they're canoeing in crocodile invested waters, infested waters, you know. And, you know, there's a chance that our character might die on the way and never get to Bangladesh to where the place of interest was, you know. Maybe you don't want to risk that. But there's a chance. Maybe it's a small chance, but it could happen. And, you know, I just, when I'm thinking about all that time compression, I think instantly of, like, all the stuff I just talked about on skills, where we kind of do the same thing. Do we invoke the mechanic or not? Do we take the average? Do we... Is it boring, or do we just not want to risk um, a small chance of failure? Or is it just like, ah, let's just, just go on with it, because it's not uh, really dramatically um, important at this moment. You know, let's let's go on there. Cause, so I think there's a real similarity. And, you know, a lot of other things we do with, with uh, game mechanics are, are, you know, to me, really similar. Because, you know, when it comes right down to it, ignoring a small chance of failure equals moving the story forward. Ignoring the boring stuff equals moving the story forward, you know. Figuring out where to do that is is uh, is of interest. So like I, you know, here's some questions I want to ask you, and this is not a video like what's right and what's wrong. It's more like you know, these are some of the questions I ask myself, um, or I'm finding myself ask myself now because I have these two or three warring different um, points of view. But let's go with this list because I like to hear your um, your feedback on this. You know, why do you choose to play things out in a granular manner sometimes? Or why do you choose to gloss over them different times? Is there a sweet spot for you, like between those two extremes? And, and where is it? You know, when the sweet spot migrates, if it does, and when it migrates on the spectrum, because I believe it's a spectrum, you know, why does it migrate? Um, does this change for you depending on what game you're playing or who you're playing with? You know, so if you gloss over things like time compression or, you know, skill resolution or task resolution, whatever it is, uh, do you do it for the same reason, different reasons? You know, what are they? 
are things like weevils in the flower just simply not cool enough or do you not want them to kill you? You know, do you not want to risk that small chance of failure? And if you don't, like why? Is that place of interest that important? Or, you know, what is it for you? Um, and as a group, here's a really important uh, question. You know, as a group, how do you decide what to skip over and what to focus on? You know, Anthony mentioned this in his video a few times. Like, you know, when the game master decides to skip over something, you know, sometimes your players say, hey, wait a minute, back up. I wanted to do something there. I had this thing I was going to do in town or whatever it is, or I want to role play this through this particular situation. You know, sometimes even though, you know, the outcome is fairly certain already, but it was something of interest to you. You know, maybe it wasn't the place of interest, but it was something of interest. You know, so sometimes we have to learn to come to consensus. And this this is important, not just, um, you know, uh, game master and player, but sometimes, you know, the players t together. Um, and also the other thing that's important, as, as Anthony mentioned, was not rolling over somebody's agency, you know, dictating what their character does, uh, you know, what their character's like, especially if it doesn't fit their concept of who their character is. But, uh, you know... Sometimes we want to roleplay through stuff, you know, and, and roll the dice in a more granular manner, and sometimes we want to back up. So uh, I think what I discovered at the end of the day, at least for me, but I believe it's probably true for other people, is that there's there's priorities and motivations that are in opposition to one another um, in this decision-making process for all those questions. And this isn't a bad thing. It really isn't. I, but I suspect it's more of a, a spectrum than a solid division. And to me, it's it's a fascinating because while we got these different priority levels on moving the story forward, on internal consistency, fairness, the rules, may the rule of cool, etc., at some point we make this conscious or maybe unconscious decision to prioritize one or the other, one of these um, priorities um, or motivations during some you know the times or, or actions where we call decide to call for a role or, or don't roll. Um, so I'd like to hear from you know for um, the people watching this, like what is your thought process? Have you ever thought about it? You know, what's your internal conflict or, you know, your, your algorithm? Because I think we all kind of have this algorithm in our heads. Um, and I probably left some parts out. But, like, maybe we, we, you want to use the mechanic that's in the game. You want the skills and abilities that you've invested in, in your character, to have real meaning and not just be kind of, like, just written down on a piece of paper and not really mean anything. Um, you want the dice and the system to have meaning and not just be ignored as a result of, like, GM fiat or, or by, you know, fiat of the other players or even by yourself, maybe. Maybe you want things to be internally consistent in the game world. Maybe you want things to be fair. Um, you don't want things to be arbitrary. You want to have uh, real chances of success and failure. Um, however, there are certain parts of the story that you find interesting, and other parts you kind of just want to take for granted. Uh, maybe you want to focus on things that are suitably dramatic um, or support a character arc or a story arc. Maybe you just want to do cool stuff and be cinematic, you know, be a musketeer. Um, maybe you want to focus on your character functioning within their world but on the parts of that that are interesting to you, not, not so much on the mundane parts. So I think we all have these divided priorities and, and, and motivations at war with each other. And But I, I think in a lot of cases, we're not even aware like how we make these decisions. It's kind of like by feel. And uh, I believe it's not only influenced by our own motives for playing the games, but also like on who we gamed with in the past you know, and what they did. You know, and I suspect, uh, you know, no people, people just don't know like how much, um, how much of an influence those other people had. Um, I think this, I think this um, decision-making process that we have, it's probably a lot more intuitive than logical. Um, but lifting the veil on this, this decision-making process is really the part of this that's, that's of interest in, to me. Because I think these, uh, these oral traditions that we've had, these regional dif differences, are pretty fascinating. Um, and remember, like at least for me, you know, from my perspective, because I'm older, you know, the formative years for a lot of us, a lot of my peers, uh, when we're of gaming, our, our gaming formative years, this predated the internet. Uh, and not everybody, you know, um, got the same publications um, or got them consistently. So I got some Dragon Mag magazines, but not all of them. And I certainly didn't get some of the other publications because they just didn't come around where I was. So we gained with different people. And so often the information that we had for, like, how to, not only how to play the game, but, like, you know, how to make these decisions, we probably weren't thinking about it that way. But, like, how close do we, how granular do you want to get? How much do you want to, like, hand wave over things, etc. cetera? Um, this was limited to what was in the books for whatever game we played, but also, like, um, to the people sitting at the table with us. So a lot of this reminds me of, like, you know, the, not only the way I played the game, but, like, how others that I played with have played the game and what I took from those interactions. And not just the ones of, you know, the people I played with a lot, but just I played a con with somebody, and they, they did something a little bit different. I've kind of, like, said, huh, that was interesting. And, you know, over time, I've kind of incorporated various um, techniques or things that I've seen that I've decided were useful that I like. But, you know, I suspect that all kind of... Um, you know, kind of builds in this kind of like montage or, or amalgam of, of like what my decision making process is. But sometimes I think, you know, I'm unaware of what's really going on. You know, what I really liked um, 
was uh, Rune Singer did a couple annotated videos recently, uh, like the the Game Master's Cut. Uh, and one of them was uh, the second half of our All for One game where he talked about like what was really going on in the background in terms of rules or when he called for a rule. But one was probably even more interesting was he did on uh, one uh, on uh, Edge of the Empire. And so he plays with Andre and they play this one shot and uh, he, he talks about a lot of things that are going on. It's this little narrative like, you know, he talks about a lot, he exposes a lot of things like including like when he chooses to invoke a mechanic, when he chooses to kind of hold back a little bit, uh, when there's a little bit of fuzziness between like, we you know, the narrative structure is... Um, and what his rationale and thought patterns are. I, I, I really like stuff like that. So uh, I like to hear from you. What have, uh, you know, does any of this make sense to you? And, you know, what is what is your um, um, thought process been in all these things? You know, do these, uh, do you move around the spectrum a little bit or do you pretty much stick to your guns? And uh, Or does it, you know, it does it depend on what games you're playing and who you're gaming with? I like to hear your, your opinion on this because it is kind of a weird subject where I'm playing devil's advocate with myself about weevils and the flower. Are they important? Could they kill you? Who cares about the weevils? Let's just keep moving forward. Move the story forward. What do you think?